Und es ist so eine gute Zeit, dass wir weitergehen zu John Cowboy, den ich ein bisschen was verliebt bin. Wir wollen euch wirklich vorstellen, unseren Freund und einen wunderbaren Mann, John Mark Homer, der heute hier immer, weiß nicht hier, aber er hat eine Videobotschaft für euch zum Anschauen und zum Hören geschickt. Wir glauben, dass er wirklich von Gott gehört hat und wir hoffen, dass du das genießt und das empfangst du dich noch. Vater, wir bitten, dass du unsere Ohren öffnest zu hören, dass wir hören mit beide offenen Herzen. Danke, John Mark, und für alles, was er tut, für die Kirche in Portland. Wir beten deinen Segen auf ihn, auf seine Gemeinschaft. Wir beten, dass du mit ihm bist, und wir danken dir für ihn in Jesu Namen. Amen. Hello to all of you across the pond and watching online. John Mark Comer here. I wish I was with you in person. I think it was a year ago when Pete Gregg was kind enough to invite me to come over and teach for the event. And I think the original event was set for Spain. And he said, take your time, pray about it. And I said, dude, I do not need to pray about that. Spain in October, tapas, 24-7 prayer, I'm in. And then the event was moved to Belfast. And I have nothing against Belfast. Actually, I really like Belfast. It's just you know, Spanish weather's a little bit better, but that's okay. And then now here we are watching from your laptop. But really the question is, what is the Spirit of God stirring across the world and in your church and in your own life and leadership? And, you know, Pete said, hey, just teach on that. Whatever your best sense of discernment from the Spirit is, what is the Spirit of God up to? And again, I'm not a prophet per se, I don't know, but here's my best take. First a metaphor, then a teaching from scripture. First off, the metaphor, you know, I live in Portland, Oregon, which is up in the Pacific Northwest of America, and I live right in the city, but the city is built up against Forest Park, which is the largest urban park in, I think in the world, for sure in the continental North America. And it's 5,000 acres of just basically straight forest. And a, a while back, a year or two ago, we were able to get a house right on the edge of the park. So I'm five minutes from Powell's Books or Hart Coffee, if you've ever been here. But my backyard, I don't have a backyard, I just have a deck, and then it's 5,000 acres of just forest, and it's gorgeous. But there's a problem in Forest Park, and some of you are to blame. It's English ivy. So some of my ancestors, whenever, a long time ago, brought English ivy over and you know it's an indigenous species for those of you in the UK but here it's a noxious weed and it's very toxic to the forest but it has just taken off like wildfire and it literally has covered the entire park so there's this massive like city initiative to de-ivy forest park but to de-ivy 5,000 acres it's literally growing up every single tree in the park is no small task but it is suffocating it is squeezing the life out of the forest so when we moved in about a year ago this time, we kind of tore out all of the ivy on our little piece of property and it's back breaking work. And once it was all gone, it was, it was in fall when we kind of tore everything out. I think it was October or November. And it was hideous. All that was left was mud and like torn up root systems. And then all of the detrius from however many years like that property was there. There were beer bottles and knives. There was like a crazy like stuffed animal of a rabbit missing its eyes. It was like right out of a Stephen King movie. I had to take it and like, put it in the garbage can and, or whatever you call it, the trash bin or whatever, and cast the demons out at the same time. It was like next level creepy. And all winter long, it was just bare and ugly and stripped to the core, just mud and it was desolate. But then, right about a little time after COVID hit our city in the spring, it just started to explode with all sorts of new life and growth. I mean, in one part of my kind of yard, there are literally about two or 300 little maple saplings and alder trees and wildflowers. This is one called a trillium. This is really rare flower in our area, and it's a three points named after the Trinity. It's beautiful, and it started to grow right next to my deck, all because of the stripping away. And in, I don't know, about April or May in the spring, I was sitting on my back deck in prayer, like, God, what are you doing in the church? And I don't think COVID-19 is from God per se, much less all of the social unrest and the political polarization and the wildfires in my city, all that we are living through. But yet I do think that God is up to something through all of it. 
And I just felt the spirit kind of, kind of rise up in my heart with that very simple word picture of, you know, COVID-19 for the church is not just a stripping away. And it is kind of that winter season. Even as we were living through summer, it was very clear at a soul level, it was winter. And there is a stripping away kind of in Jesus' language of John 15. I think there's a pruning right now of the church, a stripping down of the core. Eugene Peterson, I was reading his teaching recently on John 15 and Jesus' picture of abiding and pruning the vineyard. And he said, when you prune a vine or when you prune a Christian, you decrease the distance between their heart and their root in God. And I think God is doing that. He's stripping away what psychologists call our attachments, what we Christians tend to call our idols. And he's like, he's shrinking down the distance between the surface of our life and our heart and our root in God. There's a stripping away right now, but there's more than just a stripping away. I think there is a reseeding right now of new life and creativity. I think God is giving his people dreams for what comes after or even right in the middle of COVID. What does the church look like on the other side? It's a time not only of desolation, but also of new inner generativity that God, I think by the spirit, is reseeding in his people's hearts. Lots of people are dreaming right now. I felt the Spirit of God speak to me, pay attention to your dreams. But dreams are not an easy thing to live with. On that note, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis 37, to a well-known story, but I think it's worth kind of another look. Genesis 37. Let's pick it up if you have a Bible in verse 2. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph a young man of 17 was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, bad idea, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Now, this is an honor-shame culture. Joseph is not the eldest brother, and this is a slight to his brothers. Hence, his brothers, verse 8, said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Like the meaning of the dream was very clear. Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. Then he had another dream, and he <laughs> did not learn from his mistake, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father full on rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Joseph is a dreamer. God's people have long been dreamers. As long as God has been in relationship with people, which is a very long time, he has been giving them dreams. Now, when I say dreams, I don't just mean literal dreams, as in while we are asleep, that, and I have a biblical theology of that, but I mean dreams in the broader sense, as in any kind of vision for your future, or a prophetic word, or a word of wisdom or knowledge over the role that you are to play in the family of God, or even just a gut sense in your body, if I feel like this is going to happen, or I feel like that is going to happen. Maybe your dream is for the church, that you lead or that you're a part of or where you pastor. Maybe it's to start a new prayer room. Maybe it's a new justice initiative. Maybe it's for something on the backside of COVID-19. But my guess is, maybe it's nothing to do with that at all, but my guess is deep in your body is a dream. And my guess is that at least part of that is from the Spirit of God. Dreams play a key role in our life. Without dreams, you know, we just kind of wander in circles. Dreams are like a map for the road of life, or at least a compass heading for kind of the direction we are to go into. Dreams are one of the many ways that God leads and guides us, and you could argue they are the primary way 
that God leads us and guides us into our identity and our calling, into who we are made to be and not made to be, and what we are called to do and not called to do. This is where, if you're familiar at all with Ignatian spirituality, kind of the Ignatian view of desire has been so helpful to myself and thousands of others down through church history. Our desires, which is another way of saying our dreams, are often God's desires in us by the Spirit that point us in the direction of God's will for our life and our future. We have to dream, we can't not, we are human. But dreams are a tricky thing to live with because there is always a gap between the dream and the reality, a gap of time, a gap of circumstances, a gap of capacity or character. And in that gap, which could be a few hours or a few decades, we run the gamut from hope and anticipation and faith and patience to despair and melancholy and doubt and impatience and sin. Enter Joseph and his story. I would argue that Joseph's story is a paradigm for how we are to live in the gap between the dream and the reality. Because for Joseph, and I think for you and for me, the journey from dream to reality was anything but a straight line and it was not fast. It was three steps forward, two steps back, it was zig and zag and up and down, it was non-linear, and honestly, as we're about to discover, it was a very long, hard road. We don't have time to read all of Joseph's story, but let me point out just a few key moments. Skip down, if you still have your Bible open, in chapter 37 to verse 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their flocks, their father's flocks near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks. Come, I'll send you to them. Very well, he replied, 17. So Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Notice the moniker for Joseph, the dreamer. Come, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. And you know the story, that's exactly what they do, minus they don't actually kill him. Even worse, they sell him into slavery. If you look at verse 28, the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him down to Egypt. Notice, Joseph now goes down to Egypt as a slave, not as a ruler. It is the exact opposite circumstance of his dream. Instead of people bowing down to Joseph, Joseph is bowing down to people. Then to make matters worse, he has a run-in with his master's wife, if you know that story about Potiphar's wife, and he goes to jail for years. Then in chapter 40, if you have your Bible, we read this, verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, most of you know this story, offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry, put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. They were assigned to Joseph, verse 4. After they had been in custody for some time, verse 5, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, and dreams will often affect you at an emotional level. They answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. The story goes on, and in an ironic twist, Joseph is able to interpret their dreams to the letter. All the while, his own dreams have not come to pass. Can you imagine, if you were Joseph, how that would make you feel? The baker has a dream, three days later it's fulfilled. Same with the other guy, but not in such a good time. Joseph has a dream, years go by and nothing. He's left to rot in a dungeon. But take a look at chapter 41, verse one. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. Now everybody at this point is dreaming. 
He was standing by the Nile when out of the river there came up seven cows, sleek and fat. They grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows, ugly and gaunt, came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. The cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. Okay, that's a stunning dream right there. And if you know the story, none of his wise men or astrologers can interpret the dream. Then verse nine, the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings. Pharaoh was once angry with his servants and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream the same night. He retells the story. There's this Hebrew guy there. He was so helpful. It turned out exactly as he said. So verse 14, Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. The story goes on and Joseph is able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, even though once again, his own dream has not come to pass but we see the first glimmer of hope down in verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. Notice the wisdom that's come into his life through this process. You shall be in charge of my palace. All my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Here it is. The dream is starting to come to pass. The slave has now become a ruler. The youngest son has now become the number two in command, the de facto kind of leader of Egypt, the empire of the world. And finally, in chapter 42, there's a famine and we see the dream come to pass. Chapter 42, verse one. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And as this is happening, there's a stunning line in verse nine. Then he remembered his dreams. Then he remembered what was latent in his heart for so many years. Now, we don't have time to read this entire story. There's more, that's the short version. I'm guessing most of you know it. But finally, at the very end in chapter 45, verse four, he says to his brothers, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. What a story. There's a lot I think we can learn from this story about how to live in the gap between the dream and the reality. Notice four things about Joseph's dream and its fulfillment. When the dream finally does come to pass, it is one different, two harder, three longer, and four better. A short word on each. First off, it's different. Joseph sees his brothers bowing down to him. He does not see slavery in Egypt. He does not see prison. He does not see years of waiting and some of them in a dungeon. He sees a little bit, but is blind to a whole lot. And dreams are often like that. The reality is to the dream what a tree is to the seed. All of the raw materials are in that seed, but it's just a fraction of the whole and you don't yet know its full potential. When we get a dream from God, a desire in our heart, an idea in our mind, an opportunity in our circumstances, we might get 10 or 20 or maybe if we're lucky, 50%, so to speak, of the dream, of the vision, of the reality in our mind, but there are whole chunks of it missing in our imagination. Or we see the future, but it's muddy and it's ambiguous and it's not clear. I think of Paul's line, now we know in part, but then we shall know as we also are known. N.T. Wright has that great line, Line about how all prophecy about the future is signposts pointing into the fog. I love that signpost. Those of you in England or where I'm from, the Pacific Northwest, we're familiar with the signpost pointing into the fog. And that's because the point of a dream isn't to tell you what's going to happen in the future. It's to tell you how to live in the present. 
In fact, God seems to be against his people knowing the future. There's an ancient sin that we read about all through the Old Testament called divination, where you would divine the future through a witch or a medium of some kind. And divination is still around, both like through a shaman or a psychic reader, but more popular in a secular culture through just like an op-ed or a futurist or a podcast or a pundit on the news. So many people, in particular over the last year with COVID and everything else, just pundancy after pundancy after pundancy, people saying this is how it will go, when the reality is it is just educated conjecture. But we want to know the future because knowledge is power. And I think our theory is, even if at an unconscious, not conscious level, if we can know the future, then we can have power or control over the future, and then we don't have to trust God. But God doesn't want us to have control, per se. He wants us to have faith. And that is why God will rarely, if ever, in my experience, tell you at least exactly what is going to happen and when. Instead, he will tell you just enough about tomorrow, put enough, just enough of a dream or desire in your heart to show you the next step on your spiritual journey, how to live today, show you what to focus on, what to watch out for, what to gear up for and prepare for over the horizon. That matters not for tomorrow, but for today, not as an act of control, but as an act of surrender to God's future. Because of that, when the dream does come to pass, and I'm old enough now that I've had multiple dreams from minor to major that kind of started to rise up in my heart and after a long period of waiting came to pass, when that does happen, it is often, or in my experience pretty much every single time, a little bit different or a lot different than what I was expecting. I've learned the hard way, in particular for somebody like me, I'm very much a planner, to expect the reality to look and feel different than the dream early on. So first, different. Second, harder. As I said, Joseph sees a picture of his family bowing down to him. He does not see the dungeon. He does not see Potiphar's wife. He does not see you know, waiting in the cistern. He does not see years of like getting sucked into a foreign culture. He sees all of the good and none of the bad, all of the glory and none of the suffering before the glory. Maybe because God knew he wasn't ready to hear that part, it would just crush his spirit. Um, or maybe God did speak that over Joseph. I don't think so in the text, but maybe. And he just would not hear it. He found a way to kind of filter it out. I've done that before. Explain it away, shove it under the rug. We all do this. I did it very recently. Every January, I set aside a few weeks to just pray and fast and ask God for a vision for the year, of he year ahead. And this last January, I, in all honesty, I forgot everything that I felt the Spirit of God speak, me, speak to me. And I came back to my journal in about April, a month into COVID, and it was all about how the year ahead was a year of storm and suffering. And I just blocked that in my mind. I think. I just was not into that. Like 2020, storm and suffering, awesome, thanks God. I literally just blocked that, moved on and forgot all about it within weeks. I think we do this on a regular basis. But whether like God spoke to Joseph or not, we all do this. We get a dream and then we romanticize it. The future in my mind is often escape from reality, not a future reality. It's always this warm, fuzzy, like utopian space in my mind where all of my problems will go away and I will just be happy all of the time. Marriage, honestly, is a great example of this. You know, often when you're single, you think, oh, I'll be so much happier in a marriage or whatever, and I get the ache of loneliness and all of that. What single people don't realize is that marriage doesn't often, doesn't always quench that ache. But we go into it with so much romanticism, and ironically, that does nothing but sabotage the reality and the joy of the relationship itself. We think life is the straight, kind of linear arrow to success, but so often it's not, and we, like Joseph, are blind to this. So first, different. Second, harder. Third, longer. There are eight chapters and upwards of 22 years between the dream and the reality. Joseph, if my math is right, is 17 when he dreams. He's 30 when he becomes ruler of Egypt, but nine more years go by, seven years of plenty and two years of famine before the dream comes to pass, 22 
years. That is a very long time, some longer than some of you have even been alive. As is often said, there's a time gap between the conception of a dream through pregnancy, so to speak, a prophetic pregnancy, to the birth of a dream. God will often conceive something in your heart long before it is born out into the world. I hear from God and I think, okay, that's a great idea. I love it, I want it, let's go do it now. But often it's months or years or decades ahead of God's timeline. In my experience, and I don't have a text for this, just my experience, the larger the dream, the longer the waiting period. And the smaller the dream, the shorter the wait. Small dream, short wait. Long dream, long wait. But either way, this waiting period is usually way longer than we expect or most of us want. Did you see that one line at the beginning of chapter 41? When two full years had passed. It's just a throwaway line, just a short little, but can you imagine sitting in your dungeon for two full years, no word from God? This is pre the coming of the Holy Spirit, no like morning scripture and coffee and prayer and a good reminder from the Spirit a few times a week to just stay through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. None of that, just in a dungeon, alone in the black for two full years. What happened? Nothing, as far as we can tell, outside of Joseph, a lot inside of him, more on that in a minute. But man, can you imagine how that would have felt for Joseph? Waiting on God is hard. I should know, I'm terrible at it. I'm the last person that should give you a pep talk on this. My personality is long range planner, strategic thinker, Um, kind of living in the future is easy for me. Living in the here and now is very hard. Honestly, COVID has been so hard for me because all of my plans and even my capacity to make a plan, I mean, planning right now is a bit of an exercise in comedy. And this has actually been so good for me. I think God is, is, again, stripping me away of that attachment to the illusion of certainty and planning and all of that. But I'm just lousy at waiting in faith and in patience. But there is a phrase all through the library of scripture that I love, and it's just this, the appointed time. You read about it in the Old Testament and in the New. If there is a dream that is from God, then there is an appointed time for it to come to pass, for your dream to become reality. You can only be pregnant for so long, as all of you moms know. At some point, that baby has to come out. And when it is finally here, it is number four, better. When Joseph's dream finally does come to pass, it's different, it's harder, it's longer, but it's also better than he ever expected. But not necessarily better by Joseph's human metrics. Joseph's dream, or at least his interpretation of his dream, was all about his own glory. I mean, you saw that in chapter 37. His pride was just dripping off the page. And he did get glory eventually, but after years of shame. In the end, the dream wasn't about Joseph at all. It was about saving the family of God and the world itself. But before God could bring the dream to pass, he had to strip it of all of Joseph's ego and the idolatry of the dream itself. And this is kind of, I think, God's MO. He takes our dreams that are all often, even if they are from God, corrupted by our ego and compromised by our culture and kind of all about our own glory. And then he makes us wait and maybe even suffer a setback, and maybe even go in the opposite direction of our dream. And the beautiful thing that happens in that waiting period is the dream is stripped of all of that ego and idolatry down to the raw essence, the part of the dream that is from God that's about love, not about ego. And we're stripped down too. We grow and we mature and we're set free from idolatry and attachments into the kind of people who can steward the fulfillment of a dream with wisdom and humility and generosity and Christ-like character and emotional maturity and capacity. When people have dreams that come to pass too early, it is rarely a good thing because they do not have the capacity or the character to steward it yet. And they can't even enjoy it because it's an idol. They need it in order to be happy at an emotional level. So first, God often has to deal with the idolatry of the dream because it often becomes our God rather than a gift from God. We want the dream more than we want the God who put it in our heart. We think the dream will satisfy us and make us content when no dream can do that. No answer to prayer, no spiritual renewal, no church plant, no marriage or relationship or child, only God can do that. 
And so often I think in the scriptures and in my own life, God will let the dream die in order to set our heart free, to bring us to the place where all we have and all we need is God himself. That's why I think there's often a, a Christ-like kind of cruciform shape of a dream through death, burial, and resurrection. But when that dream often comes back to life as it did for Joseph, it's not the same. It's different, it's harder, it's longer, but it's better. But by God's metrics in the kingdom, not by our own in the culture. And we find it was more than worth the wait. Different, harder, longer, better. It kind of sounds like a Nike advertisement or a campaign. I promise, I don't think it is. It's biblical theology. And I would argue you could lay this template of different, harder, longer, better over pretty much any character and dream in the story of scripture. Moses and his dream to lead Israel out of slavery. David and his dream for the temple in Jerusalem. Paul and his dream to go to Rome. As I said before, God's people have always been dreamers. To end, you know, there are all sorts of people who right now are watching from your living room or your kitchen or wherever you're at with your group or not. And you have dreams in your heart. Some of you need to start dreaming. And this is just an invitation for you to open up your mind, your imagination, your heart, and let God not just strip you down through COVID-19 and all that has come with it, but to reseed in your heart a prophetic imagination for not just your future, but for the future of the church and God's call on your, the role that you are to play in it. Others of you, you have a dream that right now is like, maybe you put it, maybe it went through the burial phase and that's the last time you thought about it was, I, I think it's dead, I think it's over. Maybe God right now is stirring something up in a spring-like way where you just start to see that shoot poke up through the mug. Maybe there's something that you know is from God and you're pregnant with it, but you just can't get it out and you're feeling the pain and the weight and the exhaustion of that at an emotional level of waiting. The call for all of us is to trust. To trust God is to surrender the illusion of control. And when I say trust, I don't just mean sit around and watch TV or Netflix or whatever. Trust is active in scripture. It's not passive. It's something you do, not just something you wait around for. Meaning we don't just say, okay, God, do your thing. I'm over here, like, thanks, whatever. I'm playing Star Wars Battlefront on my you know, video game console or whatever. Not at all, like we actually go out and activate and partner with God to see the dream come to pass, but we do it with an open fist and a content heart at peace. God, here, here's my feelings, I'm confused, I'm excited, I'm nervous, I'm hopeful, I'm doubtful, here's my desires, I really want this to come to pass or I don't want this. And God's, here's my trust, not my will, but your will be done because this dream isn't my God. You are my God. And in the present or in the future, when it comes to pass or even if it doesn't, I'm still okay because I'm living in the kingdom of God with Jesus. In closing, in this season of chaos and unrest and division and strife and outrage, may you dream and may you dream well. May you open up your mind, your imagination, your body itself for the Spirit of God to deposit into the deepest part of you his desire for your future and the role that you are to play. And when it's different, may you trust God with that. When it's harder, may you not give up, may you persevere and endure and keep at it. When it's longer, may you wait with faith and with patience. And when it's better, may you give thanks and weep for joy. Peace to all of you. Danke so sehr, Jean-Marc. Und wir hoffen, dass ihr empfangen konntet, was er zu sagen hatte. Und vielleicht antworten wir da jetzt einfach drauf. Vielleicht von einer Posture, vielleicht kann man physisch etwas tun, das uns hilft, zu symbolisieren, dass wir antworten auf das, was Jean-Marc gesagt hat. Ich lade euch ein, und dich mit uns hinzuknien, wenn du kannst. Ja. Wir wissen, dass es manchmal anders ist. 
härter, schwerer, länger, aber im Ende besser ist. Und Herr, wir bitten dich, dass du kommst und dass du auf unsere Träume bläst, dass du auferwächst, Träume, die gestorben sind, in, in Sachen kommst, die schwierig sind, dass du arbeitest in unserem Herzen, in unserem Leben, an den Träumen, die wir haben. Man sagt da einmal, die, die träumen in der Nacht in diesen Ecken ihrer Wachen auf und sehen, dass alles nur Staub ist. Aber die Träume von heute sind gefährlich, weil sie können ihre Träume mit offenen Augen träumen und es wird passieren. Er ja, macht uns Träumer des Tages mit offenen Augen. Komm jetzt und atme auf unsere Träume, während wir dich anbeten in Jesu Namen. Amen. It's so great to relive some of those really special moments from the gathering, although it's pretty bad that we're still wearing the same clothes. I know. <laughs> from the I Sunday. Know. I look at that and I worry about my hair and all sorts of things, but it was an amazing session, wasn't it? Yeah, it's so good. There's so many other sessions that you can catch up with as well. Just head to the website 247prayer.com. They're all there for you.